Hi, today we're interviewing Andrew Feldman. He's an alumni of Ryerson Rams Robotics. Andrew, please tell us about yourself. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew. I'm uh, an alumni of Ryerson's mechatronic program and the R3 Mars rover team. Uh, it's so nice to meet with you today. I'm studying mechatronics engineering and Trevor's studying mechanical engineering. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it and it's my pleasure to give back to the community which gave so much to me. So what are you working on right now, Andrew? I'm working at Trexo Robotics. Uh, Trexo Robotics is an exoskeleton company which produces exoskeleton legs for children with mobility issues. We're also working with some youth and there's a few adults who are trying to, to fit into our device currently. So working there entails designing, building, and testing of exoskeletons for that very goal of just increasing the reliability of the product and making sure that we can increase the mobility of children who need it. Can you give an example of, of an exoskeleton, like what it would be? Sure, no problem. So exoskeletons are primarily devices that exist outside of the body in order to facilitate or actuate muscle movements. So those can be assisting with muscle movements that you may find strenuous, but you're physically able to do. Uh, and in our case, we're actually trying to um, affect neuroplasticity in young children. So we're trying to get them to walk for the first time in a certain pattern, a correct gait that they've never walked before. And we're hoping that just the repetitive motion of that creates some neuroplasticity within the children. We have some studies that we've done that have shown that, and we've actually had some kids who have graduated from using the Trexo. They're not fully mobile, but they've exceeded all our expectations. And in terms of what an exoskeleton is, technically speaking, it's, as I mentioned, it's an exterior actuating device for muscles, primarily using motors, controllers, sensors. It's a whole closed loop system, mechanical, electrical, software side. There's many components to it. It's very much the same as any robot that anyone else would build. However, the it's geared towards children with the intention of actuating um, biomechanical movements. That's amazing. It's a lot of fun and uh, definitely joining R3 and being a part of the Ryerson community definitely was a stepping stone I needed to take in order to get to this position. So on that note, what was your journey to where you are now? Well, I'm glad you asked. So <laughs> I actually uh, started Ryerson in uh, September 2014. Started as a general engineer, undecided as most people are in first year. More specifically, my goal was to work in the biomedical industry. I wanted to have a role that I could feel um, was rewarding and that wasn't just another job. I wanted it to feel like I was affecting the world and affecting people and helping people. Um, I previously worked before I went back to school to do um, engineering at Ryerson. And I realized very quickly that you have to enjoy your job and you have to find what's important to you. And I found that even in jobs I maybe kind of enjoyed, there were things that were lacking in terms of the reward. And I knew after watching videos on YouTube and hearing stories of people and just working with people who have disabilities as a volunteer, that this is an area where I could really affect change where technology wasn't fully implemented yet. And I wanted to be an engineer of the future who was going to work on these types of projects. Not sure what, but the world is a place that needs a lot of helping and change. And I already knew that that was something that I was looking for. So I decided to do the mechatronic program. As I said, I was already leaning towards mechanical, um, but I felt mechatronic gave me a nice, well-rounded skill set. It allowed me to focus on mechanical by being in the mechanical program at Ryerson, however, giving me a little bit of introduction or maybe a bit more than an introduction um, to computer engineering and electrical engineering, as well as robotics and industry. So I was on a few teams or I started to join teams in my first and second year. I was on the solar race car team and I was on the uh, Tetra design team in my first or second year. The solar car team, unfortunately, didn't ever come to fruition, which is a bit disappointing. So I immediately kind of pivoted and wanted to join R3. R3 really appealed to me because I had already had machine shop skills. I had done the course at Ryerson. It was being offered at the time. Um, I wanted to work on something where I could practice those machine shops and I could learn more beyond what the Ryerson program was offering me. I felt that... Um, no offense to our program, but it lacked in some of the hands-on 
um, skills that I knew would be needed in industry. And so I knew that a design team would be something I needed to join. So after working on a Tetra team, and then eventually I also became an exec there, you know, <laughs> uh, I would wear my R3 polo, but unfortunately I can't find it right now. But after working on a few of those teams, I realized like, okay, robotics is what I'm doing. The R3 team is going to give me the most experience with the most hands-on experience the, with the most information. And it was a strong, good team that had lots of projects, which allowed me to really fit myself in there and not really rely on some of the other um, bureaucracies that existed I found in some of the other groups I was in. Since I joined R3, it was probably in my co-op year, but I found it a bit difficult to keep up with the workload and a full-time job. When you're in school, for some reason, you have, when I look back on it, like there's so much you get done that you need to get done in that time. But just working the job and joining R3 was a bit daunting. So I was on the team a little bit in my co-op year, but it really came through full steam in my final year where I joined on the Mars Rover team. I was acquainted with some people on the team and my skill set was a bit higher up than some of the lower levels. And then it, it all kind of culminated in my capstone project, which was uh, a wheel and hub redesign for the rover of the uh, 2018 rover. Hmm, awesome. And you spoke a little bit about the team. So do you have any favorite memories from your time on R3? I don't have any specific memories. Definitely have lots of memories of being in like the R3 cave, you know, in the design zone, hanging out there, trying to get some work done. Also memories of getting a lot of work done, um, long hours, interesting characters always coming in the door and also some people who are on the team who you just never really interact with because they're just not on your sub team it was always a revolving door but not in a bad way it was like a revolving door in the sense that the door was always open and it was always very welcoming and people were always coming in and other than that the highlights of it were like the skills that really stuck with me i guess that i remember is well, as soon as i joined i remember realizing like wow this is a lot more intense than what we really learn in school. And this is probably how it is in industry and probably what it's like to work on some of these projects and thinking, huh, I should have been on this team earlier, but I'm glad I'm here now. And I wish they told us some of this stuff in some of our programs, but they didn't, but I'm here now and it's good. And I was happy to be there. And um, yeah, just remember like put in the hours and just after every class kind of popping in and uh, just being a part of the, the community. Everything yeah. you just described is exactly what I think, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's hard you to put it so specific. well. I can really relate to what you're saying about the hands-on because it kind of feeds into each other. You get to apply what you learned in class, and then what you're learning on the team helps what you're doing in class because you get that concrete, real-world perspective. Exactly. A textbook can only go so far. Profs can be great, and they cannot be great in the same course, and you don't want your experience to be completely dependent on that your engineering experience, which project or not. And you got to just um, go for it. And you got to accept that you have a lot of work to do and that you're going to do more work, but it's like what's needed and eventually it'll be over. But I'm, I was glad I did it. No question about that. Are there any skills that you learn on the team that you really find yourself using a lot now in your job at Trexo? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, like R3 allowed me to grow and perfect other skills that I had, machine shop stuff, catting, design, um, one thing that wouldn't really ever, I would consider in my design, but being part of R3, it made, immediately made me consider it. And as well, it's something that's considered in our work at uh, Trexo, um, is designed for manufacturing. You can have great designs and there's plenty of designs and variations, but how realistic is it to manufacture that elaborate design? How expensive is it? Is a simpler design just as efficient? So those, that was something I, that was a consideration they taught us in class, but you never really had experience with it. So I felt that was a, a pretty big skill that I gained from R3. Um, your designs are being scrutinized by manufacturing standards or what's like doable within our budget. Um, and that would only really be a consideration on a report in a class, right? But it wouldn't be something you would, you could just kind of brush it off because you put it in your discussion. I also found that, um, my machine shop skills were improved, just getting practice there. Um, even when you do the course, like the hours you have on, on those machines are quite limited and it's really good to get practice. It's really good to be familiar with all the hardware that there is and what it's capable of, what it's capable of in theory, what it's capable of in practice, 
um, what tolerances that creates, what problems then that creates. So all those things which you learn about in school, but it's um, we're not always given like a practical experience in it, as we mentioned. So those things kind of all brought themselves together with our three and they just grew and um, yeah, I'm using them to this day and they're continuing to grow, but there is definitely a basis um, in all that in our three. What would you say is your most marked or distinct characteristic? Well, I'm glad you asked. Some people say that I'm outgoing and I try to implement that in my engineering practices. It's important to have a good social network at your work and on your design team. You're there to get a job done and you have a task, but no one wants to be miserable all day doing that. So I think it's important to be outgoing, to be happy. We all get frustrated all the time by stuff that we're doing and that's perfectly normal. But um, I'll just say outgoing rather than happy because, you know, it can be a fine line sometimes. I like that. It's definitely important to have fun when uh, yeah. when you're doing projects together. It just makes it like better overall. You get a better outcome and you enjoy your time more. The outcome is 100% better and people want to work on improving it again. It's not like, okay, we finished it and we're done. Let's never do that again. Oh, that was hell. It's like, okay, let's, let's iterate. Let's design again. Let's take it back to the table. You want to have good memories of that. I'm trying to tie that in with our three a little bit. Definitely the struggle in the moment can seem really hard, but then you look back and think about all the camaraderie and how much you got through together. And then it's really gratifying. Exactly. Yeah. You want to have good memories looking back. You don't want to uh, look back on it with negative memories. And, and as you were saying, it definitely does affect the outcome. Like the final product is, is a representation of the group dynamic. So what would you say you most value in your colleagues? I would say that work ethic is probably the most important thing that I value in my colleagues, um, whether they're subordinates or people who are higher than me. You always want to see people working hard and independently. Uh, you don't have to be killing yourself in terms of work. You were supposed to have fun and you should have some social time. And that doesn't even need to be scheduled. You know, that can be kind of ad hoc, not necessarily horsing around because, you know, there's safety things to consider. But I value someone who works hard and they show that they're interested in what we're working on by their work ethic. It's not a matter of dragging them to work hard, but they're inherently inclined to work hard because they want to do well and they're interested in that project. And someone who's really not afraid to ask questions or propose new ideas or solutions, especially within a team. When you're joining a team, especially an existing team, it can be very daunting to be part of that team and very intimidating. You don't want to ask too many questions about the design because you don't want to call people's design into question and things like that. However, assuming everyone's all on the same page and we're all working towards the same goal, those questions are important because often you have a new perspective that someone else maybe wouldn't have. And it also shows that you're thinking you can propose an idea that was maybe already tried and validated to not be a good idea, but it's good to know that you're thinking and that you're on that page and you're you're going through the thoughts of the processes that the design team have previously gone through. Um, if you happen to be new to that team, or even if you're part of an existing team, it's um, always good to ask those questions. Uh, we're all on the same team and we all want to do better and we all want to succeed together. So that's when, what I value, as well as a little bit of independence in the sense that once you've asked your questions, which can be many, many questions, and there's definitely no limit, but you should try to learn from that question and like learn from the answer rather than just being like, oh, that was a yes or a no to my idea. And just kind of, you should try to internalize the answer because that might be the answer to other questions that you may have down the road. And um, as someone who maybe deals with people who are interns and stuff, they may ask the same question a few times and it doesn't always reflect that well on them. I sh maybe shouldn't be saying that, but that's generally, you want to be able to think independently. We're all smart and we can think independently. Uh, we don't need our supervisors to spoon feed us everything and we can we're all on the team together so it's not like they're bossing us around to do something we all want to succeed and we all want to do it together and uh, we don't want to miss anything so questions all the time and be independent i've heard before too it's the type of question you ask or the types of questions that you ask that can kind of show the person how interested you are like if you just ask something for the sake of asking something versus something like that has an in-depth answer or something they're genuinely curious about. You can kind of tell like how interested the person is to, to learn. 
Exactly. Yeah, it shows their initiative. It shows that they are interested. Even if they don't have a good question to ask, you can still show you're interested and you're engaged and you're listening by asking not necessarily a silly question, but a question that may seem obvious, but maybe isn't obvious to you. Um, what is your motto? Yeah, so as I mentioned the last question in terms of what I value my colleagues, my motto is that I try to live by um, don't be afraid of criticism, always try to improve. So like those two go hand in hand. Some people may be critical in a, a negative critical way, and that's unfortunate, but ultimately criticism is meant to show you what you did wrong and, and make sure that you don't do it again so that you can be a better engineer or a better project manager or, or worker or whatever you happen to be doing. Um, like no one is perfect and we can all be better is I guess another way of kind of saying that motto. We can always improve on something. There's always something that we can improve on. We've never completely hit our limit, especially in the industry that we're in. There's always emerging tech and there's always something else to, to look at. So don't be afraid of criticism and always try to improve. And I think if you don't take criticism personally, but you take it for what it is, I think it'll really allow you to, uh, to succeed. I like that. I think that's really true. There's a lot to be said for the scientific method, like constructive criticism and constructive dissent. You get a lot, you narrow into the better idea when you can all uh, pick an idea apart and then put it back together. Exactly. So as, as a team, almost certainly, but even individually, people aren't trying to knock you down. They're just trying to help you. They're trying to help you by telling you what you did wrong. And we have these social beings in us that kind of take that like a bit standoffish and it might be hard to take but we kind of have to get over that because ultimately there's good information that you're being told about that criticism and um, if it's a criticism you heard once you're probably likely to hear it again so it's something to keep in mind and something to try to improve on and and also helps you identify your weaknesses so that when you want to when you have spare time to practice something or you want to learn more in a field you can recognize that that's maybe somewhere that you're a bit weaker. Even if you happen to think that you weren't initially, someone can maybe, I don't want to say put you in your place because that's not a good way, but advise you that, you're, that your skill set could be better or that you kind of have a knowledge gap. Yeah, always, it, it's no one's out to get you. And if, there are, if they are, that's on them. And you should just like shrug and like laugh at those people because you're all on a team and you all should do better. And if someone's goal isn't that, I want to say that's their problem. Unfortunately, your team and it's kind of everyone's problem. But um, surround yourself with good team members who have the values that we mentioned before. You know, work ethic and that uh, who are independent, who want to be there, and who put in the time because they ultimately enjoy it. So now I want to ask you: Are there any accomplishments that you're proud of? Well, so my work at Trexo has been very pride provoking. So as I mentioned before, we work with children with disabilities. Every day we're not necessarily working with those kids. So it is hard sometimes in the day-to-day -day kind of everything to remember what the end goal is. But of course we have a group chat and we hear information from all different parts of the company. And we, you hear stories of like from parents of their responses, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. We see videos of kids four months ago to today and like, oh, look how my, that kid was struggling to walk and the device really had to do a lot of the walking for them as opposed to now where we can see how much they're initiating like through our, some of our metrics. And now you're like, wow, they're walking by themselves. Like the device is still running, but you can see they're really initiating all the steps. Um, the device is really not doing that much work. And even most recently, actually, we had a kid who graduated, quote unquote, from Trexo. Uh, I think he's only five or six years old, but he kind of like succeeded or exceeded or reached the maximum potential, I guess, that there was with Trexo. He originally was not able to walk well, and now he can, I, I can't, I don't want to report specifically on this individual case because I don't know, but we as a team deem that Trexo has done all we can and in a happy, positive way, the parents are happy and we just feel like we've increased the quality of life for this individual. Um, likewise, we have actually at our work, um, which is, not I'll go on a little tangent, but at our work, we have three staff who are actually parents of children, which one makes you a bit confident or pretty confident, I should say, in the product. You're like, oh, the users want to come work with us. 
to make it better. Okay, wow, we must like be doing something right. And they're the ones who are talking to other parents, they're in sales or customer support, and they really can relate. And um, one of our staff members mentioned in our internal chat, she said, oh, the, the unit was down for a little bit and I went on vacation or I was unavailable to use it or something like that. But pretty much her child hadn't used the device for three or four weeks at this point. And she said she put him in before she even turned it on, he just started to walk. And hearing stories like that are extremely rewarding, uh, makes you feel very proud of the work you do. So it's not every day at work that you hear that, but you have to kind of remember that and not get lost in the daily grind of everything, because that's kind of, as I mentioned earlier, why I went into this field. And luckily I've positioned myself in a good spot that I've kind of fulfilled this dream to this point. And of okay, course, shivers. R3, R3, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of success with R3. I was, like I said, I was only there for the year and a half, really. But our capstone was very satisfying. And it was great to do that testing and to redesign the, the wheel hubs. Um, when I was working with the team, a lot of the rover was already designed. But I heard the rover team did great that year. Well, I know that they did because I was in the chat. And that was also pretty darn rewarding because going in, there's a lot of uncertainty before those competitions. It's like, what are the other schools going to bring? Are we ready? I hope everything is okay. And I think that you became second. Yeah. But second you, in the world. So. Yeah. 2019. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was great to hear. That was very satisfying. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there, but that, that was a great moment. That was really a kind of a culmination of my final year. I hope we can experience that too. <laughs> <laughs> trying our best to do that <laughs> but yeah that story of, of the the kids walking that gave me shivers like that's incredible yeah. it's honestly it's uh I'm, I'm really lucky that i i'm working at this place because like that's exactly the kind of thing i wanted when i went back into engineering like when i was applying for the program not even just in the middle of like the program but it's like this is why i'm going back to school to do this and yeah so i'm i'm very lucky and that's why i'm happy to talk to you guys and talk to anyone on r3 and just tell you in my opinion, like what are important points to kind of hit and checkpoints to do and, and things just to kind of put yourself in the best position to get the jobs you want and to get the career you want. What was your most challenging environment or concept that you worked with? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> I found actually getting a good team was very difficult. That was probably the most challenging environment at Ryerson. Sometimes you wouldn't always get to choose your teams based on lab allocation, or sometimes teams are just randomly allocated to you. And I found that, as I mentioned before, it's always good to have people who are invested in your team and you want people who are inherently want to work. Unfortunately, when you don't always have team members like that, it can be very challenging. And it's an uphill battle, which in my opinion, trumps any conceptual problem that you may have because you can always look at other videos and try to figure that out and talk to other people on your team. And you, it's just kind of a knowledge gap. And you're in that position with many other people, everyone else in your class is having difficulty with that project or that concept. But it's particularly challenging when you feel isolated because there's other people in your class who are on great teams and everyone's doing well and your team is really lacking. And it feels like everything is on you. That can be pretty challenging and not desirable, tough to get through. And unfortunately, there isn't always like a clear solution. I will say, though, for all the students who are listening, that's not really the case in industry as much. As much as profs want to say like, oh, you're on a team and you have to suck it up if your team members are bad and don't come to me. When you work somewhere, you, you have a bit of recourse. You have employers and inherently you hope that your coworkers um, are a bit more motivated, if, if anything, just by the fact that they could lose their job as opposed to a student who doesn't mind getting a, a poor mark. So you'll get through it as a student and those challenges become a bit less so in industry, at least according to my experience. And I feel like with a job too, um, during the interview, the employer kind of feels out how you are and they'll pick the person based on how they think it'll, everyone will interact with each other. And so there's kind of like the uh, characteristic match in a, in a workplace. Definitely. There's a lot of vetting that we do. We want to make pe sure people have the skill set, have the attitude, have the characteristics to work on the device with the team, within the team, yeah, and with other team members. That's good to hear. 
it's nice to imagine a future in industry where we get to work with the people who are as excited to work together as we are on the team. Like, that's something I find about the team. People who don't want to be there just gradually stop coming. So exactly. the people who are there like just really want to be there. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I realized that my experience may be different than other people's. Um, this wasn't said earlier, but I, I work at a startup. There's really only five of us who are full-time, maybe four. And then we usually have a one-to-one -one ratio between interns. So um, the interns want to be there. They want to learn. And those of us that are there, we want to be there. So I'm very fortunate to be in a work environment like that. So speaking of robotics, what are you most excited about in the field of robotics? Well, there's a lot of potential for growth, obviously. I mean, like technology is getting cheaper and smaller on the software or electronic side. On the hardware side, there's only so much you can make smaller in terms of actual actuation of, of physical items and stuff. But things are getting cheaper. The tools that are out there are getting cheaper and more accessible, enabling us to do more complicated designs for cheaper and more easily. There's always new materials that are kind of like coming out. Those are exciting, but it'll of course be a while until they kind of trickle down until they're out of the R&D stage and they're a bit more affordable. And in terms of robotics as a whole, just more and more complex tasks being performed in the next 15 years or so, I imagine that there'll be more like quality of life, maybe not 15 years, but quality of life should increase for people globally as robotics becomes more prevalent and as energy becomes more available because robots are ultimately just big labor saving devices and they can do very simple tasks and very complicated tasks and there's a lot of tasks in between that we have not yet filled you may look around society and just see where people's jobs are and if they can be replaced by robots i'm not suggesting that that's not fully what i'm advocating you know we need people in the workplace but the jobs that people don't want to do and hopefully we're at a point in society where people have financial or social security to the point where they can, um, like we can afford as a society to give some of those jobs that people don't want to robots and people won't suffer and they won't have, oh, I don't have a job, but they can get a better job that's more what they'd like. I don't know if that's 15 years down the road, that's a bit more of a utopian answer, but ultimately like hopefully this century or the next like 40 years or so, we can really start to eliminate a lot of those jobs while also increasing the quality of life for the people who would have been doing those jobs and they can get better jobs that they would like that are more suited toward their skills or, or something like that. Yeah, I like that. I, I think sometimes when like robots start replacing like people's jobs, like let's say the, the touch screens at McDonald's, just as an example, people think like, oh, robots are going to take over. But like you said, it's not that they're taking away a job, it's that it's replacing a job with something that they would like to do more. Yeah, and I, I, we all realize that that's a fine line and it's a hard conversation to have, right? Being in robotics, we're inherently, or a lot of robotics is inherently automation of tasks that people were doing beforehand. But we need to just grow as a society along with that. And I think that um, as long as we don't leave people behind and just try to replace them because it's cheaper, or rather we try to improve their quality of life by taking away their job that they don't desire as much, I think that's a better perspective. So how do you think robotics can be made more inclusive and accessible so that more people can take part in it? So I think that robotics should always be inclusive, of course. When we talk about inclusiveness and accessibility, unfortunately, they both have big social stigmas to overcome. Assuming that is kind of being reduced gradually over time, which I think it is already, assuming we continue that trend, I think robotics is already growing more diverse gender-wise. You can look around your classes where you can look at maybe the class sizes now of every entering engineering class. And I would bet that there's more diverse group entering each year successively. In terms of accessibility, more accessibility than inclusiveness, I would say that uh, technology has a big role to play and is very key here. We mentioned before tech becoming smaller, also more mobile, more remote. I mean, the pandemic has demonstrated that maybe not happily, but we can all converse and get stuff done from our homes and do more work remotely. When we need to do work remotely, the tools are there miraculously and we all work towards it and it affects everyone. When it's not affecting everyone, the push to do that is less cohesive. It's less done by society as a whole and it's a few smaller players. 
Um, but I do think like as technology becomes more accessible, as people are able to purchase technology at cheaper prices and people are able to design adaptive technologies as well, going forward at cheaper prices, accessibility will just become inherent to design, hopefully. But as I mentioned, I do think that there's some social stigmas about that. And I also think that many people, when they're designing, are not possibly considering accessibility as part of their design. I'm sure that younger people are definitely thinking about that more. It's something that is taught in school or we're, we're, we're taught to design for accessibility in our design courses. I can't speak to the older workforce and I don't know what society was like back then. So I do have hopes that people will inherently have an eye towards design for accessibility and inclusiveness going forward as time goes on. I think that'll kind of snowball itself. Um, not anything against people who are older in the workforce. I just think that society has changed and our, our considerations of people has changed. So to summarize, tech is helping. Everyone has a phone in their pocket and now you can get an app that makes something more accessible as opposed to five years ago, 10 years ago, that wasn't even an option. And even without that app, the technology is still in that person's pocket or on their wrist or somewhere where it can be at a cheaper price and the hardware is there and we can just uh, we should try to build on the systems we have. So back when you were at Ryerson or at an, any other point in time, uh, what was something you would say you did differently from most people that helped you find success? Yeah, so success... It's, it's interesting because when you ask that, I think like, am I really, did I really succeed at anything, right? We all succeed at like small things, but I don't consider myself like as a, a success. But it does remind me of the earlier question where I was talking about my job and how I felt lucky to be at my job and how I felt like I kind of earned my way there. So in terms of what helped me kind of get the job that I wanted and to succeed, to cross those milestones, right? Su success is always kind of being pushed. Your milestone or your definition of success is always being pushed as you're kind of doing something else, which I think is great because you should never feel satisfied. But I don't know exactly what I did differently at Ryerson. I took advantage of all the resources that were available. So I mentioned R3 and other design teams I tried to join or was a part of, but maybe they came to fruition or didn't. There's a lot of fabrication labs. Even if you can't get on a design team, you can always work on your own projects, whether that's a hobby project or an independent project or a project that's not necessarily an official school design team. Ryerson has fabrication labs, uh, Toronto Public Library offers stuff. There's resources all over and you have to kind of look out for them and, and take advantage of them. I'd say that what contributed a bit to my success was I knew, as I mentioned before, I worked a few years before I went into school and not everyone has that luxury and some people wouldn't consider that a luxury anyways, but not everyone has that experience. I think when I came into school, I was pretty focused on what I wanted to do, knowing that I wanted to have a job that was in engineering that I found fulfilling, that was helping people, as I mentioned earlier. And so that kind of allowed me to make a decision, my next decision and my next decision and the one following, always kind of with that in mind. I think that um, it's important that you're not afraid to ask people things. I know I mentioned questions of your subordinates, but even professors at Ryerson, opportunities that are there, you shouldn't be afraid to ask about them. I wrote a paper for a professor and how that kind of happened was I enjoyed his class and I had spoken to him once or twice before just about discussing a test. And I felt that he was a pretty nice guy. And then I just showed up at his office one time and said, hey, do you have any volunteer work? Anything I can do, work on any papers? And he's like, yeah, I do. But you know, volunteers will come for a bit, but then they we're not paying you, so you're not going to stick around. And I was like, no, no, I'll stick around, you know, and I, because I knew I wanted to do it. And I mean, that was his opening for me to leave if I wanted to. Um, but I knew I wanted to do it. Eventually, I, I got paid. I'm not promoting like working for free for the university. But I showed that I was eager to do that. And all I had to do was really ask and then just keep showing up. And then eventually, hey, you know that paper you're helping us with? We got some more money in the lab and we can pay you now. And it, it was great. And I was like, all I had to do is ask. And in my first year, I thought it'd be so hard to get a research position. And it seemed so intimidating. And you really have to know everyone and have an in or something. But I just showed up at his office. I don't even think he re remembered me from the other time I was there or from class. But I just kind of showed up and asked maturely and, and then um, realized it's what I wanted to do. And I kept on putting the work in and uh, it bared fruit. Another thing I would say is along that line is network. It's very cliche. I almost hate that I have to say it, 
but I got this job through networking. I went to a biomedical zone event. And actually, I think I had to skip class for it because you know how it is. There's always so many things going on and you always have class and you should go to class as often as you can, but like risk reward, you know, sometimes you got to like do what you think is going to be best. And I went to this biomedical zone event because I was like, that's kind of where I want to be working. I want to work for one of these, these companies, one of these startups. So I, I arrived a bit early or at least before the speaker, but there was like the orientation that had started or the, uh, the walk around. And I spoke to all the companies and I just introduced myself and it's painful. You know, it's awkward. You don't really want to be there. But at the same time, you're both looking for the same thing. You're kind of looking for a job and you don't want them to know that you are. And you're just pretending like you're I'm just introducing you to myself. Oh, do you happen to have a job? But they're also looking for prospective people who they want to work with. And so you're both kind of after the same thing. You both probably find it awkward. You just got to do it. And you also just got to play the numbers game. Speak to a few people because never, you never know what happens. In my particular case, I had met someone with, uh, with a company and he just in passing mentioned the company I'm working at now. And we were briefly in correspondence through email. I was looking for a job and I shot him an email because, you know, it couldn't hurt. He got back to me. Oh, no, we're not looking for anyone right now. But I asked to have like a coffee or to show up at the work. Actually, I asked to, to come in and just see what they do because I was curious of what they did. And I thought it would kind of reinforce my networking. Um, and he happened to mention Trexo Robotics where I'm working now, just in passing. And a few weeks later, and we had an amicable, okay, well, I'll be in touch. It was great meeting you, that kind of you know, just a uh, friendly uh, interaction. And uh, I noticed a posting a few weeks later for Trexo Robotics and I shot him an email and said, hey, do you mind introducing me? I think this was the company you mentioned. And two days later, he introduced me to the, the CEO and that got me an interview. Obviously that only gets you so far, but I don't think if I skip, if I went to class a day and I didn't go to the biomedical zone event, I maybe wouldn't be working at Trexo. I probably would have another job that hopefully I would like that probably would have came from networking as well. But you just never know who you're going to meet, um, what name is familiar. And people have been there before too. They have tried to get jobs. They're probably trying to get a better job themselves. They like their job, but they, I'm sure everyone wants to accelerate and, and go to the next step in their career. So they're happy to lend you a hand because they know what it's like. And it feels awkward, but just it's worth it. That's great. Well, you've already given us so much good advice. Um, but now I'm going to ask, do you have any parting wisdom for students who are looking to enter the field of robotics? Yeah, okay. So make sure you like it. <laughs> you have to, you're going to be doing this job for probably the rest of your life, at least a good portion of it. So make sure you like robotics and that there's at least something about it that's rewarding to you. Engineering doesn't always have to be so technical. I think those are the skills that's important for us to learn in school. And I think it's important for us to learn those hard skills in school. However, you can work at a, at a company in robotics and you be interested in robotics and maybe work up a bit less on the, on the hard side, more on the project management, if you so choose. But mostly yeah, make sure you like it or some aspect about it, whether it's getting your hands dirty or, or planning it. Be prepared to work hard. You're going to work really hard in school with everything. In the workforce, you're also going to work hard, not as hard as in school, but in school, you have to work double as hard because you have to do your coursework. But I highly recommend that you join a design team or do some side projects or both is best. At my particular work, when we're vetting new candidates, a lot of the stuff we're looking for is hands-on experience. We're not looking at transcripts that much. At least I haven't been. It's something that's maybe considered as like the fourth or fifth thing. It's like they hit this, they check mark on that, check mark on that. And that's like, oh, what was their grade? And it's never really a break, uh, like a yes or a no thing. We want to see that you have hands-on experience and that, and that you, yeah, and that you really enjoy it. It'll show from your work. It'll show from the hands-on experience that you have. And also there's always more to be learned. There's always, it's a constantly changing field. So you're never going to know it all. And even if you feel like you know it all at a point in like a few months, there's plenty of new stuff to learn. There's always resources out there. YouTube, online, the internet overall, obviously goes without saying the year is 2021. The internet's a great resource and try to um, learn from other people's mistakes that they maybe have online when you're doing your design projects or your side projects. And also don't be afraid to fail and things will not work, but that's okay. You'll eventually get them to work probably, 
but sometimes it's like a week before you can get something to work in. It's a lot of troubleshooting and it's very frustrating, but it's it's usually worth it. Oh, thank you so much for talking to us, Andrew. It was a real pleasure, pleasure. getting to meet you. My pleasure. Uh, we're lucky to have had someone like you on the team. Well, I don't know about that, but it was <laughs> uh, my pleasure to be on the team. And thank you guys for letting me be on the team and contribute whatever I could when I was. And it's my pleasure to give back to the R3 and Ryerson community. And uh, you can share my info with uh, anyone if they have any questions. Um, yeah.